Hello everyone. I hope uh, you all have enjoyed some wonderful, strong Brazilian coffee and are ready for the next panel, which will look at fostering international cooperation in the field of artificial intelligence governance. Before we move on to this panel, and I invite the moderator and the panelists on stage, we at UNESCO are very committed to making sure that different voices from around the world are heard in the framework of the regional forums that we undertake. And I would like very briefly uh, to share with you the perspective and the voice of Wafa Ben Hassin, specifically looking at questions related to the ethical dimensions of artificial intelligence and international cooperation that is needed in this field to make this vision a reality. What comes to mind when I think of artificial intelligence is a big machine processing all sorts of data all at once. And so this involves smaller data made into big data that's processed in a way that could either be used to assist in decision making or to make the decisions themselves. I think one of the biggest challenges associated with artificial intelligence is especially when it is used in cases that are vulnerable categories, such as when we use artificial intelligence in the criminal justice system. Um, this can be used to make a decision that is untransparent and that has really great ramifications on individuals' personal liberty. My key message to governments or to policymakers working on AI is that we should not be handing over these decision-making processes to vendors or to engineers that work at vendors. They're not elected officials. And we need to make sure that humans, again, are kept in the loop. Even if we're using a machine to help policymakers make decisions, it needs to be an assistance. It can't be definitive. It can't make the decision itself. And we need to make sure that there is oversight, there is accountability, and that there's a lot of uh, regular input into this process of machine learning. I think the UNESCO, as well as other international actors or international bodies, need to work together to establish standards to have member states of the United Nations and the private sector and civil society work together to implement these standards that respect human rights and that are reflected in domestic legislation as well. I think connecting those dots together are really important, and a body like the UNESCO would be able to do that. So reflecting of what Wafa Ben Hassan has said, one of the commitments going forward of UNESCO following, as the ADG Moesh Shakshuk underlined, our decision uh, at the General Conference from our member states to develop a standard-setting instrument in the fields of the ethics of artificial intelligence is to ensure that we are not reinventing the wheel, but are encouraging international cooperation and building on the great work and the great partnerships that we have established with partners from different sectors around the world to ensure that this standard setting instrument is inclusive, is diverse, and reflects the wonderful work that has been done by organizations such as the OECD, who launched their Principles for Artificial Intelligence that was most recently adopted by the G20, the ITU, with whom we are working closely, UN ECLAC, and many other partners from civil society and the technical community around the world. So in this regard, it is my pleasure to invite to the stage the moderator of this panel, Mr. Moez Shakshuk, Assistant Director General for Communication and Information of UNESCO. I'm very pleased also to invite to the stage, sitting next to Mr. Moez Shakshuk, Sasha Alanoka, AI policy researcher, global governance on the AI roundtable, and part of our initiative, the AI Civic Forum. Thank you, Sasha, for being with us. It's my pleasure to also invite to the stage Sarah Box, senior counselor from the Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation of our very close partner and friend, the OECD. Gaspar Hyatlej, the International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence at the Joseph Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, Slovenia. This Category 2 center was just established by our General Conference a couple weeks ago, and we look forward to working with the Institute very closely in this regard going forward on AI. <laughs> Sofia Yaramillo, the legal advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Valeria Jordan, Economic Affairs Officer from UN ECLAC. <laughs> 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 
Pritam Malur, who is the head of the Emerging Technologies Division at the ITU. And Edson Prestis, who is not only a member of the IEEE, but also a member of the UN High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation, with whom we are working very closely. Thank you very much for being with us today. Yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. And uh, please welcome all these uh, leading panelists. I'm very happy to moderate this panel. And uh, following my intervention this morning, I think that why we are keen to, to be able to, to have this, uh, this workshop, because we want to show that the cooperation, international cooperation is key to address these issues. We cannot deal as UNESCO alone within, uh, without all these uh, different organizations. UNESCO as a standard setter and the laboratory of ideas is playing a leading role on, on shaping international debate on the future of AI and its governance. Its uh, multidisciplinary mandate positions the organization to address the ethical and social implication of AI and promote its development. That takes uh, into consideration, as I mentioned before, human-centered values. So this panel will address how to ensure, how to ensure international cooperation in the field of artificial intelligence governance. Specifically, this panel will address the following. How can multilateral cooperation on AI be ensured between relevant international and regional bodies so that we are not reinventing the wheel as it concerns the development of norms and standards in the field of artificial intelligence governance? What kind of strategies, what frameworks and principles have been developed so far and at the regional or international level in relation with artificial intelligence and the human-centered values? And what remains to be done? What is the role of UNESCO? What is the role of uh, your organizations to be able to address these issues? So we have um, a lot of panelists, seven panelists. So uh, we have a, uh, also a lot, short time to address these panels. So I will, I will um, introduce them. But uh, I will give the floor uh, first to Sasha Alanoka, AI policy researcher on global governance on AI Roundtable, AI Civic, uh, Civic uh, Forum. I mentioned about the Civic Forum in my intervention, so I don't want to re 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 describe it again, but I think you have the floor. Please give us more emphasis on what we are doing sure. and what is the objective of this forum. Yeah, please. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a long time that I've been in Brazil, but I forgot a little bit of Portuguese, so I'm going to try to speak in Portuguese, but also in English. Uh, so thank you very much for your question regarding the AI Civic Forum. So I think we've discussed this morning about the multiple initiatives, you know, also in Latin America to build some AI national strategies. Also, there's been many initiatives regarding the AI ethical guidelines to make sure that we can develop uh, AI ethically with a responsible use. Um, and I guess there's been like some amazing efforts being done in this field. Some of it being done actually by some of my co-panelists. So I'm thinking about the OECD and the AI ethical principle. I'm also thinking about IEEE's um, uh, principles for uh, responsible adoption of AI. But there's been a missing part in this equation, a crucial one, which is citizens. Despite, you know, there's multiple efforts, I think that we forgot also a bit of civil society. And in the end, when you think about the impact of AI, the people who are gonna be the most touched by it, also citizens, people around us, so non-experts, non-policymakers. And when we think about a technology such as AI, which has such, you know, which is complex, of course, which is dynamic, which has such a, a crucial impact and infiltration in our daily lives, we absolutely need to make sure that everyone has a minimum level of awareness when they enter you know, this, new, this new digital life. And so this is really the goal of the AI Civic Forum, is to make sure you know, that people, citizens, can proactively and regularly uh, be included in deliberations on AI ethics and governance, to be able, of course, you know, to raise a level of awareness, to raise a level of AI and digital literacy, but also to inform the global governance of AI conversations happening. And I'm very aware of UNESCO recent votes on the standard setting instrument for AI ethics, which is a... Um, yeah. You, you also, you have been um, organizer of this uh, global governance of AI roundtable in Dubai, like yes. in February. Yes. Can you tell us how we engaged with the, all these stakeholders coming to that forum and how you see the way forward with this civic forum? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the global governance of AI roundtable is one of the pioneer initiatives to bring together uh, different stakeholders from around the world, from different disciplines, 
Uh, it was held annually in Dubai. Uh, last year was the second edition. And we brought together 200 uh, top AI experts from academia, uh, from uh, policy, from industry, to come together for a three-day forum to speak about some of the most emerging topics. One of the key highlights was also the methodology, the collective intelligence methodology which was developed. Um, because we, it was a lot of effort, of course, you know, to bring together those different people. Um, there were 14 different expert groups, and we took six months to prepare this discussion to make sure that during those three days, you know, we could really reach some, uh, some key great, insights. Great, great. Thank you very much. I will jump to my friend Pritam from ITU. So the ITU established the IF for Good Global Summit, which UNESCO is pleased to be partner on. The intention of the summit is to connect artificial intelligence innovators with problem owners to pro propose solutions to meet the sustainable development goals. Can you tell us more about uh, this initiative and uh, the major outcomes of last year's summit to provide artificial intelligence solutions for sustainable development goals? Challenges. Uh, thank you, Moez. And first of all, let me thank you for the invitation uh, to participate in this fantastic forum. This is my second time in Sao Paulo. You know, first time I was here for Net Mondial. Oh, yeah. uh, so. Uh, you know, it's good to see this uh, city be in the center of the conversation on governance. So um, quickly, you know, uh, so the AI for Good Summit um, is uh, an annual summit uh, that happens in Geneva, hosted by the ITU. But in partnership yeah, microphone. Oh, sorry. But in partnership with uh, 35 in partnership with 35 UN agencies, uh, UNESCO is a very close partner. And also uh, with the XPRIZE Foundation and the ACM, Association for Computing Machinery, for those, since it's a university, those who in the computer science field would know. Maybe change the microphone. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Working? Yes. OK. Uh, for those in the comp science field, you would know that that's the, uh, you know, uh, that's the association f where uh, uh, AI conversation happens for computer scientists. So uh, this year, it's uh, from 4th to 8th of May. Do mark your calendars. And the intent of the AI for Good Summit is essentially uh, you know, to connect the innovators, uh, the problem solvers, the experts, with the problem owners. You know, they may be policy makers. They may be civil society. You know, anyone with an AI challenge. And it's also you know, to have this uh, global dialogue on uh, you know, safe, inclusive, uh, trusted development of AI. And also uh, equity in uh, you know the way people access this uh, the technologies. So uh, there are different tracks. Uh, no, uh, so this year uh, some of the uh, topics that we are going to handle is uh, AI and climate change, AI and uh, uh, criminal justice, you know AI and uh, smart mobility, AI and uh, uh, so we are also looking at the culture track where we'll work with UNESCO. Uh, quite a few different areas, AI and trust, AI and zero hunger. So uh, th these are the areas. And the way we structure it uh, is, is uh, quite interesting. You know, there are different things for uh, different people. So there's a you know, breakthrough track for experts to come in, uh, look at technologies uh, that are state of the art, and see where they can be applied you know, so that after the summit, they come out with uh, solutions that can be scaled. The second track is a solutions track. Uh, where you know the technology is already out there, uh, fairly mature. There are case studies. What's needed is more scaling up. And uh, the last one, you know, is the uh, uh, the innovation factory. Uh, that's the title we have, which is for startups to come, you know, showcase their uh, technologies uh, to the UN agencies, to the uh, venture capitalists, to the private sector, so that we can see how uh, that can be evaluated and scaled. So quite a lot happening. And uh, you know, in terms of uh, concrete outcomes, there have been 30 projects uh, that have come out of uh, the summit last year, and uh, several more the year before. You know, just in terms of concrete outcomes that uh, have impacted ITU and the UN agencies, uh, we have a AI and health a focus group that we have with the uh, uh, WHO, which is looking at uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's in there for two years, which looks at uh, a framework for uh, safe and responsible uh, development of uh, healthcare applications. We have an AI and uh, autonomous driving, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles group, which is actually developing what you would call a driving test for uh, uh, AI-driven vehicles. You know, uh, AI Commons, again, a platform framework for developing an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, where the innovators can come meet the uh, uh, problem owners. Uh, you offer a trusted environment for them to test the AI applications, you know, well-evaluated tools. So there's a lot happening. And let me just conclude quickly by saying, you know, uh, we really want uh, organizations, private sector entities, universities from this region 
to participate in the summit. So please feel to uh, reach out to me uh, after the session or just go to our website and uh, you know, contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Pritam. Thank you. It's very important to mention. Now I move to Sarah. Okay, we, we know that in May 2019 I, I was there and uh, the OECD countries approved the OECD uh, Council recommendation on artificial intelligence. This was a great achievement of OECD and we really consider this achievement as our starting point in developing all the standard, standard setting uh, principles. Um, what is the role now as you achieve this uh, of the international cooperation? How do you see uh, a co a co cooperation among international organizations, intergovernmental one, but also NGOs, you know, they are very engaged also on these artificial intelligence topics. How do you see this in your perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much. And may I add my thanks to the organizers for this very timely event and also to Brazil for such a warm welcome. Uh, Brazil is actually a very active participant in the OECD's digital economy. Uh, policy work, and it's, it's really a delight to be here uh, amongst you. So you're right, we adopted uh, the AI principles in May of this year. Uh, not only OECD countries, but also six uh, other countries adhered at the same time. We now have an additional two, so we have eight uh, non-OECD countries that have adhered to the, to the principles. They were a major milestone in global governance of AI because they're actually the first intergovernmental standard on AI. And the goal of the principles really is to, to set out a, a type of AI that is going to be innovative, but also trustworthy and respectful of human rights. So it, in a nutshell, the, the AI principles actually set out five values-based principles, um, which call on OECD, um, call on AI actors who are designing and operationalizing these systems to, to take a transparent, accountable, robust uh, approach to AI systems. Um, and it also includes five recommendations for policymakers with the idea that we need to create the right environment to have those kind of AI systems. So it talks about an enabling environment, getting the infrastructure right, and helping uh, develop the human capital that we need. Now, in terms of the international cooperation element, so the modus operandi of the OECD is dialogue and, and consensus across international uh, um, sort of spheres. It's essential for complex policy challenges. AI is definitely one of those. And uh, perhaps I'd point out three aspects in particular which embodied international cooperation in the development of these principles. First of all, uh, we would develop them with a multi-stakeholder group, which actually included our stakeholders from civil society, I'm, I'm happy to say, who are around the table on a permanent basis with our committee. So we had UNESCO there, we had IEEE, uh, we had uh, colleagues from Slovenia as well. So it was a really uh, rich, diverse group. And I think what that showed uh, is that we do have some common core values going forward, which is, I think, an important thing to note. The principles also embody international cooperation in the fact that, that beyond the OECD, we now have these eight non-member countries. And as was pointed out by Sasha, we also saw the G20 adopt AI principles, uh, which draw on the OECD AI principles. And there too you had this international dialogue and discussion about the risks and opportunities and the appropriate way forward for AI governance amongst those G20 countries. And uh, in terms of uh, going forward, one of the policy recommendations in the principles is actually international collaboration about implementation. So how do we go about developing standards? How do we go about building AI expertise? And I think there's, this is the window that we have right now. I think events like today show that there is the will and, and the opportunity to go forward together. I think we see the OECD AI principles as a foundation stone around which you would build a constellation of deeper ethical guidelines, perhaps along use cases, AI and science, AI and health and so on, where we can reach out to different stakeholder groups and really build on the expertise that we collectively have. Great, Great Sarah. Uh, it's very important what you mentioned, especially when you highlighted the implementation aspects of this recommendation. L let me now move to uh, Edson. Uh, you were a member of the UN uh, Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, which recently released a report outlining recommendations for international cooperation in the field of digital transformation. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, these recommendations, specifically it concerns cooperation in the field of the development of artificial intelligence? Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so a... much. First of all, I'd like to thank you so much for inviting me to join this amazing panel. Uh, in this report, uh, you try to uh, delineate the artificial intelligence, the digital, co the digital problems, the problems in the digital space, and try to think about uh, where 
digital cooperation uh, should uh, should uh, where digital, where, where cooperation is necessary. So we analyze uh, the different domains of the digital technology, and in elaborating several recommendations that are not focused directly to artificial intelligence, but you can see clearly the mapping of, of this recommendation to artificial intelligence domain. Because every time that I think, and I particularly think in, in digital technology, I think about artificial intelligence. I believe at some point in time, we, artificial intelligence and digital technology will meet. So you see a lot of uh, digital device, device with uh, uh, power by artificial intelligence. So when you think about uh, the recommendation, the first recommendation that states the, that uh, we, everyone in the world in 2030 should have affordable access to the internet, we think as a basic recommendation for artificial intelligence itself. Because uh, if, you think, if you think in terms of lifelong education, we need to uh, enable this education through the access of uh, adapted content, locally adapted content uh, material to, to allow any, anyone to capacity for the new technology. But you, you have also a specific recommendation for digital, for artificial intelligence. For instance, if you think about uh, the 5A, 5B, and 5C, they describe a recommendation to, that's necessary to check how we can map the human rights instruments to the digital domain. In my view, that is the key recommendation for artificial intelligence, because most of the people that work with technology do not understand clearly uh, the human rights instruments for the digital domain. So we need to clarify or map, uh, make this mapping. Another point is related to the autonomous system itself. These recommendations say that all, all autonomous systems should be transparent to enable that a human remains accountable for its use. And also, life and death decisions should not be delegated to the machine. That is a key recommendation that focuses not only in little autonomous Apple systems, but also life and machines, medical systems. Great, great. Thank you very much. And thank you for highlighting also the importance of this aspect related to, to raising awareness and to, 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 to present and to, to, to facilitate the, the understanding of these of this important concepts when we deal with ethics and with the uh, autonomous systems. Valeria, yesterday we met and we had a very nice presentation about EU and ICLAC. It was, for me, very, very informative. A lot of information about what you're doing on digital technologies and in the development of countries in the region. And, of course, you are here with and artificial intelligence, talking about internet, artificial intelligence governance. Uh, how you can, what is your role first? Maybe you can explain to the audience today and in artificial intelligence and what, and when, what you can do in the perspective of development of this uh, normative instrument on ethics or the implementation of these uh, principles later. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for the invitation for UNESCO and the government of Brazil to take, uh, for inviting me to be here. Now I also I switch to Spanish. Um, well, CEPAL eh, es la Comisión Regional de Naciones Unidas para América Latina y el Caribe, y desde ese punto de vista apoya a los países de la región en el desarrollo eh, en varios temas de desarrollo tanto económico y de inclusión social. Desde esa perspectiva trabaja en lo que es la transformación digital y por ende también en los temas eh, de inteligencia artificial. En ese sentido, nosotros tratamos eh, justamente de uh, raise awareness en, este, en, en lo que es estos temas, lo que implican la permeabilidad, la rapidez que están teniendo esas tecnologías y las implicancias de profunda transformación que están teniendo eh, para nuestras sociedades, para la economía y que estos cambios de modelo están generando eh, una incertidumbre eh, muy grande que yo creo que ningún país en este momento tiene la capacidad de prever en un futuro cuáles son los cambios. Entonces, desde nuestra perspectiva, eh, trabajamos en eso con la región, con, nuestros, con los países eh, que forman parte de la red de, de América Latina y el Caribe, justamente para abordar los diferentes temas, las diferentes problemáticas. Eh, primero, eh, abordar el desarrollo del ecosistema eh, de inteligencia artificial como un todo, partiendo por los temas de, de conectividad. ¿Cierto? Porque es uno de los temas que para los países de la región es, es todavía muy importante de abordar si es que queremos que esas tecnologías lleguen a cada uno de, de los habitantes de la región. 
¿sí? y que puedan ser aprovechadas estas oportunidades. Eh, también hacemos hincapié en la necesidad eh, de considerar los avances que se hacen en países más desarrollados sobre estas tecnologías, pero también incorporarlas con una perspectiva regional cómo adaptar estas, estas soluciones para solucionar eh, problemas que tenemos eh, en, en nuestros países, ¿sí? principalmente en temas eh, que tienen que ver con, con inclusión social, con desarrollo económico y sobre todo con sustentabilidad, que es un tema que es muy importante para nuestra región. Eh, asimismo, en este tema es importante avanzar en los temas de disminuir la incertidumbre, dar confianza a los usuarios para la utilización de estas tecnologías y desde esta eh, perspectiva vemos muy importante la cooperación internacional porque muchos de estos temas eh, trascienden las fronteras y se necesita un abordaje eh, internacional mmm, para tratar los, los diferentes aspectos, sobre todo en lo que son los principios éticos. ¿verdad? Y en ese punto de vista, de, 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 desde la cooperación, creo que es muy importante para los países con información sobre cuáles son las políticas de inteligencia artificial que se están llevando a cabo, cuáles son los focos, qué se puede aprender y facilitar experiencias, espacios de diálogo y de intercambio de buenas prácticas, así como, como también de medición, ¿no? para hacer eh, políticas basadas en, en evidencia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Valeria. Uh, you highlighted very important aspects, and this is exactly what, what UNESCO is believing in, because we want to really harness the, the development of artificial intelligence in different uh, regions, including the Latin America and the Caribbean. And of course, you highlighted how much is important to, 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 to support the member states on these on this, on this strategies. Gasper. You know, uh, during the last general conference, so two weeks ago <laughs> in Paris, we had the general conference of UNESCO and uh, uh, one of the decisions was taken by member states is to uh, approve the establishment of the International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence, a global one, as you highlighted yesterday. And uh, this Category 2 center is not a new, it's, it's a new Category Center, but at the same time there is a lot of other Category Center, including CITIC VR here in Brazil. So how you can uh, tell us how you will work with the different Category 2 centers and with different organizations, maybe you found here on the table, and how you can we work together on to make these uh, objectives uh, attainment? Please. Thank you, Moes. Uh, and first of all, also thank you for the invitation to, to have the, having the opportunity to being here at this, at this great event. It's also the second time for me being in Sao Paulo two years ago um, for another recommendation, which was just recently adopted at the General Conference in Paris yeah. uh, on OER, on Open Educational Resources. There was, uh, uh, has been organized a regional consultation on the recommendation taking place here in Sao Paulo. So thank you. First of all, I would like to just emphasize, as we all know, that AI has several impacts and, and aspects uh, for the social living of humankind. Um, probably the most uh, important and, and the key uh, impact would be on the future labor market. And it could, uh, AI could probably really make a big change in this uh, global labor market while bringing and autom autom automating uh, 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 the, the jobs and probably um, also um, leading to the loss of a big, big uh, uh, part of, of jobs. And therefore, it is important um, to, to um, take some action against that AI could be seen as a danger and it has to be seen as an opportunity. And here I see one uh, uh, big mission of our International Research Center on AI, which will be established, uh, was uh, approved by the General Conference, but will be established in the beginning of next year. And here I see really this center and after that also a network of such centers. I know that other UNESCO Category 2 centers in the field of AI are going to be established. I know that in the uh, uh, Arab world, the United Arab Emirates are planning to do so. Here we have a regional uh, center, the SETIC, and we have been sitting uh, together yesterday afternoon, and I see big opportunities, 
And our center, we are planning to establish, and one big scope will be, as you uh, uh, emphasized, it will be the global scope of this center. It will not be a regional one. We are looking for partners and operational uh, uh, partner organizations all over the world because I see, we know that UNESCO and also other international organizations like the OECD, like the Council of Europe, etc., and others are working on norms and standards already. And here I see we will have in the end a, a set of ideas and I think it would be important probably to first to have a common ground and then to divide the work afterwards, not to have then that every organization will work on its, in its own fields of expertise, of course, but here I see the chance also of centers like, like ours and others and the network itself then where we can help probably to, to uh, enhance international collaboration in this field. Thank you, Gaspar. This is very important, and I thank you for also highlighting the Open Education Resource Recommendation was adopted by General Conference of UNESCO. This is also a very link to open data, and it was mentioned in the, in the previous panel, the importance of open data initiatives and open data solutions. And open education resources will help also to raise awareness among people, among different uh, civil society, and among young people as well in the school, in the higher school, to be able uh, to, to understand the challenges of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and the ethics of artificial intelligence. Last but not least, Sofia uh, Haramilo, this is exactly I pronounced it correctly now, uh, as legal advisor of the, um, to the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression, you are actually aware of the need to adopt a human rights-based approach in the development of principles and frameworks for artificial intelligence. From your perspective, you, you should, how should human rights inform the development of international standards in this field? and how you see the cooperation as well within different organizations, within the UN, but also outside of the UN can be uh, very inclusive on this. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first, of also, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, the question on how to implement human rights in the AI ecosystem in general, it, it's not an easy one. It's not easy to... Um, address human rights, uh, to translate it, but it, it is possible. There are a set of substantive standards and processes uh, that ensure that companies can comply with their human rights responsibilities under the UN guiding principles on human rights uh, in all aspects of, of their operation. The substantive and the processes standards, they apply to companies in their capacity as actors that design and deploy and implement AI systems, but they also apply to states, right? They, uh, which have obligations to refrain from interfering with human rights uh, in their own adoption on the use of AI systems. I think this is something everyone has mentioned. Um, there are, I guess I, I can mention, because I don't have that much time, that there are two fundamental principles that can be woven uh, throughout all these standards and processes. The first one is the need to protect and respect individual agencies, agency and autonomy. I think n tomorrow there are a couple of panels that are gonna address the risks and challenges that that poses to freedom of expression. But individual agency and, and autonomy are key preconditions to the exercise of freedom of expression and opinion. And the other principle that I wanted to highlight is also the importance and meaningful disclosure on the part of the public sector, defined by open and innovative efforts to explain to the public how AI uh, technologies work and how and facilitate their scrutiny. Like these are just principles, but I also wanted to, if we're asking how, there are some key like practical ideas that have emerged and that uh, David Kay, the special rapporteur, has recommended in his report. And the first one will be companies should, uh, it's something that's been called as a human rights by design. Companies and well states when they're trying to implement human rights technologies uh, should orient their standards, rules, and their systems uh, around universal human rights. Um, this comes from the conception of, of the idea of having, of implementing AI through the whole process, having, like, trying to mainstream human rights through the whole process, through the, through the whole company's operation, particularly in the development and deployment of AI. Um, I think there's an, uh, companies should, 
consider how to elaborate professional standards for AI engineers translating human right responsibility into guidance for technical design and operations. And I guess this is something people have mentioned that there is a code of ethics, uh, the development of code of ethics and a, uh, can accompany this process, but this cannot, this should be complementary, should not supplement or substitute their commitments to human rights. Um, because I don't have that much time, I wanted to also mention that a way to do it is to embrace, uh, another way is to embrace radical transparency through the all uh, AI life cycle requiring governments to take steps to allow systems to be scrutinized. scrutinized. This includes human rights uh, impact assessments as one of the tools, but also all of these assessments from the beginning to the end should also come to the possibility of transforming their systems, transforming once that assessment has been done to transforming and adapting it. And another one, not least important, very important one, is also to recognize, to tackle the prevalence of discrimination in AI systems. Uh, this is an existential challenge uh, for companies and for governments, and the failure to address the discrimination or the discrim uh, discrimination in AI systems could be very dangerous. This is, I think, tomorrow, mor tomorrow morning and afternoon, they're gonna address this in length, in extent. Uh, but I just wanted to just mention these three options, these three um, pra key practical ideas, and I can talk about other recommendations made by the Special Rapporteur in like, further along. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to come back to Sasha. You, you highlighted how the work that you achieved in Dubai and also, but you participated also in the IIE, um, the, the, the Paris Peace Forum. And you highlighted a very important project that UNESCO is uh, also joining you with, with that, uh, which, which is a very good opportunity to, to, to encourage the debate over uh, with the civil society and, and over the world. And you highlighted also the uh, omni-stakeholder principle that it was now trying to be the, the principle of this AI Civic Forum. How you could collaborate, okay, we collaborate with UNESCO, but other organizations maybe around the table here might be interested. How we can join your efforts to make this civic debate uh, successful around, around? Yeah, please. That's a really good question. Because, I mean, all of what has been mentioned so far is highly relevant. And I think that, you know, there's a lot, well, there's some overlap, there's some convergence, there's also some divergence, because, you know, when you speak about AI ethics, AI governance with people around the world, even though this technology has a global impact, people have different reactions to it. And we are entitled to have those different reactions to it. I think it's legitimate, and we should not try and standardize it. We should not try, you know, and just say that it's easier to react the same way, so they just, like, blindly, you know, adopt a common, a common standard, common protocol. And so I really do think that one of those things we're looking forward with the AI Civic Forum is to cross this regional cultural perspective, yeah. Yeah. to really be able to engage different regional bodies, whether it's at a national, a regional, or international level. Um, so this is the first part of the question, I guess. It's really, you know, trying to encourage uh, to uh, leverage those different cultural perspectives to be able to see what is, like, the biggest common denominator but also what is different, you know? Because again, we're entitled to it. We often say, you know, in the UN world, uh, one world, different voices. And I think with the AI Civic Forum, this is particularly relevant. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. Come back to Sarah. Sarah, you, you, you didn't mention about the OECD Observatory. Yeah, I think it's a very important idea. And uh, follow, as a follow-up of this, of this recommendation, uh, I know that you are cooperating also with UNESCO on those issues, but uh, how do you see this observatory helping a government like uh, Brazil, but also in the region of Latin America? How, you, how this observatory can be uh, co-constructed co co with all these stakeholders? Oh, of course, UNESCO can contribute. ITU has a role. Uh, different governments in the region has a, has a, have also a role. So how we can work together to make this observatory a global one? We don't need to replicate this idea because it's a very good idea, but we need to work together on it. Please. Certainly, thanks. So the OECD has worked for several years on AI, but really with the introduction of the principles, we have started really accelerating and deepening our work now, both on the analytical and measurement side and also on implementation of the principles, because we see some really urgent policy issues out there. So a lot of people have talked about AI and jobs, but you know, a step before that is what the impact of AI on firms and productivity and growth is, and that's something we want to look at in greater depth, and also data governance, I think, is a, an important issue. 
So the window to all of this work will actually be the AI Policy Observatory that we will introduce uh, early next year. Uh, it will be a hub for dialogue, it will be a hub of policy resources uh, for governments and stakeholders as, as people try to harness the opportunities of AI for their economies and their societies. We're going to combine the resources from within the OECD because it is now a mainstreamed issue, it's across all policy areas and also with stakeholders. So uh, we have partnerships already with some organisations who are helping populate uh, what will be on the, the launch site of the observatory. Now, in terms of uh, what it will look like, it's going to have four pillars. One of the pillars will be the AI principles and their implementation. The second will be about uh, policy resources and analysis. Uh, the third will be data and trends. And the fourth will be... Um, information on national strategies and frameworks and also stakeholder initiatives which will be updated on an ongoing basis. Already uh, with, through a survey that we've worked on with the European Commission we have over uh, 200 different policy initiatives across more than 40 countries. So I think this is a hugely valuable resource for uh, regions and countries going forward. I see perhaps a number of aspects that would be particularly helpful. First of all, it's, it's an online public space and it's going to be taking stock of policies and initiatives on a live basis and what this allows is a lot of peer learning across countries and across regions. I think a second important point is about the data and trends. We have to have evidence-based policy, otherwise we're not going to make it through this, this challenge that we face. And I think what we'll be doing with the observatory is being allowing countries to make this comparative analysis and compare themselves against peers. We're going to showcase work on some of the more fundamental methodological uh, issues around AI, for example, classifications. And we're also going to be, um, as I said, because we cover almost all different policy areas in the OECD, bringing new analysis and advice to countries. There's huge value in collaborating. We're already collaborating with Slo Slovenia to uh, introduce some of the data and trends and visualizations uh, on the observatory site. Uh, and we in continue to, to do this going forward. I think uh, another factor that I would um, mention is that we were very pleased to be uh, asked by Canada and France to support the global partnership on AI. That's something that will be within the, the realm of the observatory as well and uh, that has goals very similar to ours in terms of trying to get trustworthy AI but which is also supporting innovation, competitiveness and opportunities for countries. Uh, thank you for highlighting the global panel on AI, and I think this is also another opportunity to uh, strengthen the collaboration with different organizations, but also with, ex with different experts around the world. And this is a, a huge opportunity that we can also uh, maybe rely our efforts on. Yeah, um, uh, Pritam, again, uh, I know that ITU, uh, okay, you mentioned about the AI f for Good Summit, but ITU has also several groups and uh, work streams on AI, I think, related to AI. I can highlight uh, the AI for Health uh, among, among others, but also in the Broadband Commission, I remember that uh, uh, new working groups also established within the, working, the, the Broadband Commission, uh, and UNESCO was happy to, to join as well. Uh, but how, how uh, ITU will continue to, to foster these working groups and how we can um, foster the different the synergies between the working groups and the, as, as you heard about uh, the OECD initiative on observatory or others initiatives on, uh, on uh, AI ethics, AI civic debate. So how ITU can play a role on using these synergies and to foster these synergies between different initiatives, please? Okay, uh, so I'll uh, uh, give my response in two parts. One is I'll just tell you a bit about uh, some of these and uh, how it's structured, and second, the uh, importance of collaboration here. Yeah. So uh, I'd already mentioned some of these groups. You know, uh, the uh, Broadband Commission's uh, group on AI and health, which is run by Novartis and uh, Microsoft. Uh, ITU and UNESCO uh, run the Broadband Commission. So uh, that's that's uh, doing a lot of work on uh, the advocacy aspect of AI and health. You know, uh, uh, there's also uh, the AI and health group we run with WHO. Uh, assisted driving. I mentioned a lot, you know, there's a new quantum computing group uh, that just started its first meeting last week uh, in China. Again, uh, AI is a part of the discussion. Uh, when I say, you know, uh, groups, 
these are groups run by member states, also private sector members, you know, largely led by private sector members, some of the top companies in the world, universities, these are all members of the ITU. And uh, the idea is to come together, you know, uh, discuss the details and see what aspects can be taken further, which aspects are uh, mature enough to be uh, taken further. Uh, two topics that, uh, two areas that come up again and again, which are cross-cutting, obviously, security, safety, and trust is one. And the ethical dimensions also come up quite often. And that's where, you know, uh, while ITU, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, it, it is discussed, but the lead is clearly UNESCO. That's why we are closely following the discussions that are happening at UNESCO uh, to make sure, you know, whatever is discussed there is brought into our forums so that, you know, our members can uh, you know, take advantage of that. That brings me to the topic of uh, collaboration and coordination. You know, each of us are doing a lot. Uh, but clearly, you know, together pulling in our efforts, uh, we'd be more effective. Within the UN agencies itself, uh, uh, there are some interagency mechanisms. You know, there's one called the uh, UN Group on Information Society, ANJAS, uh, which was established uh, around the time when VISIS was, uh, yeah. the World Summit on Information Society uh, took place, the two phases. That's a good interagency mechanism, obviously, for uh, follow-up. Uh, you know, we also have the HLCP uh, and the CEB, which is the heads of the UN agencies coming together discussing topics of the day. Uh, there was a 1.5 year, a one and a half year uh, effort uh, at HLCP, you know, to come up with these uh, uh, a broad strategy on collaboration. You know, so we took a three-phased approach. ITU uh, kind of coordinate, led the coordination, but it was a joint effort by 35 agencies. You know, three-phased approach. We came up with principles that should drive UN agency efforts. You know, we had a strategic framework, and then we had a set of actionable items. And, and these actionable items were divided into three categories: areas of high certainty, there where we need, we know, uh, you know, uh, we know uh, what's needed, and we take immediate action. Uh, what Edson mentioned, uh, the infrastructure connecting the unconnected, clearly is number one. That's where uh, we're doing a lot of capacity building. You know, the second is areas where there is evolving knowledge, more data is needed. And that's where we, uh, you know, we need to work with stakeholders to kind of bring that information in. And the third area, which is, you know, this high uncertainty area, uh, where a lot of experimentation needed, uh, innovation needed. That's where we need to provide these guardrails, you know, uh, for sandboxing, for uh, new things to be tried out. So we have this three-strategy approach, and we are looking at implementation now. You know, uh, that's where uh, you know the helping countries design national strategies, regional strategies. That will be the next phase that we'll be going into. Thank you. Thank you, Pritam. Very, very informative. And uh, thank you for highlighting also some mechanism within the UN system to cooperate within different agencies. I think this is this uh, uh, modalities and this, uh, these bodies that need to be enforced and really uh, innovative way as well. And we, we, I'm looking forward to maybe to, to have more discussions on this. Thank you. Uh, Edson, in addition to being a UN high level panel on digital cooperation, you are also a member of uh, IEEE, uh, leading organizations, uh, te technical committee organization that is very uh, innovative, but also a lot of standards have been developed with IEEE. Uh, so can you tell us more about what uh, IEEE is doing and how also the cooperation on those standards can be also involved with the civic debate, for example, within the, the OECD and uh, our uh, the, the observatory project? So can tell us more. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, IEEE is leading several initiatives in the, in the domain of uh, ethics in artificial intelligence. We can see initiatives like OCEAN, there is an open conversation, conversation on ethics on autonomous intelligence system. There is a global forum where join, uh, where that has a lot of uh, organizations that discussion ethics, uh, how to use it and develop standards in this domain. We have the global initiative on, on ethics of artificial in, uh, autonomous intelligence systems that published recently a very nice report called the Ethically Aligned Design that discusses several dimensions on the ethical domain, like uh, dimension related to the economic and humanitarian aspects, policy, legal aspects, implementation of ethical systems. And this gives rise to a set of work groups that are creating uh, soft laws so they are focused on different also dimensions, like uh, transparency of uh, autonomous, um, autonomous systems, uh, data privacy and protection, protection of uh, child data, 
uh, in particular, I'm running one of this working group that focuses on creating an ontological standard for ethically driven robotics automation systems. And we have others like um, TechX, that is uh, a platform, open platform also, to create a public awareness about the importance of uh, discussing ethics in this domain. So you are engaging with uh, different groups. So we have uh, people from different parts of the globe, from different organizations. There we have a, a very nice multi-stakeholder, multilateral group. So we are working together with several governments to develop uh, policies in the AI domain. In my group in particular, I have uh, more than 100 people from more than 20 countries discussing how to create this, this standard. Um, but how the technical community could be engaged more within this work or the, this, this cooperation between different organizations quickly because we're running out of time? How can? Uh, this, this group are open, so anyone can join that. So that's a very, very important point. We already have some people from uh, different organizations. In Ocean, it's a very nice platform that can, uh, where different organizations can collaborate as organization, not as individual. I see, I see, thank you. Valeria, uh, UN ECLAC. So I saw yesterday you published a report on data algorithms and policies redefining the digital world. Uh, this report was, I really appreciated a lot this report and I think that uh, this could be also guide us, uh, the, and especially the, the countries in the, in the region, different stakeholders in the region of sustainable development. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, uh, these main findings of this report and uh, how this could be used also maybe within this conference because we're discussing a lot of aspects on related to uh, this report issues. Yeah, please. Um, sí, el año pasado lanzamos este reporte que es uh, sobre datos, algoritmos y políticas, en donde justamente tratamos de llevar, llamar la atención sobre eh, este um, cambio que se está dando, este cambio radical que, que estamos viviendo que va a afectarnos a todos. Y desde ese sentido entonces consideramos eh, elementos que vienen desde el desarrollo de las tecnologías en sí mismas, que, es, que entendemos por inteligencia artificial, cuáles son sus potencialidades eh, para el desarrollo, para atender diferentes eh, problemáticas de la región, desde los temas eh, de pobreza, de inclusión, de sustentabilidad, eh, cómo el uso de estas tecnologías puede ser utilizado desde una perspectiva, eh, una apropiación local, eh, las necesidades que tenemos eh, justamente de crear un ecosistema que con entorno habilitador para el, el aprovechamiento de esas tecnologías, desde donde tratamos el tema de, de conectividad, de infraestructura, eh, del desarrollo de, de Internet de las Cosas, de banda ancha, eh, la problemática de lo que tiene que ver con protección de datos y sobre todo también el hecho de las necesidades que se requieren a futuro para aprovechar estas soluciones que, de, de tecnología, incluyendo eh, inteligencia artificial. Eh, en el reporte eh, me gustaría um, hacer un énfasis en particular en el hecho de que hemos hecho un, un levantamiento sobre la formación profesional, sobre los cursos que se ofrecen en siete países de la región, en uh, tecnologías avanzadas, en particular inteligencia artificial, para saber cómo está esta oferta académica para la formación de recursos humanos. Y nos ha sorprendido encontrar eh, que había um, una, bastante, una oferta adecuada de, de cursos, tanto a nivel profesional como a nivel técnico, eh, pero sin embargo el problema era que no hay mucho... Um, Um, enrollment en, de parte de, de, de la juventud, de parte de la población. Y entonces ahí hemos encontrado que, eh, por un lado, vemos que en algunos casos eh, son los padres los que orientan a los, a los jóvenes a que tomen profesiones que todavía son tradicionales, eh, ¿cierto? Abogados, médicos, y, y no ven este, cuál puede ser la utilidad en, en cuanto a empleabilidad en el futuro para sus hijos en, esta, en este tipo de formación avanzada en, en tecnologías o en aplicación de tecnologías. Y eso nos lleva a pensar que eh, necesitamos mayor educación ciudadana sobre las, las transformaciones que se están generando, no justamente para eh, que... Eh, 
impulsar a los jóvenes que adopten ese tipo de, de, de tecnologías, este tipo de formación, porque en el futuro es lo que va a cambiar las reglas del trabajo y donde puede, se pueden generar muchas fuentes de, de inequidad en el sentido no solamente eh, del acceso a, a, a todas estas tecnologías, sino la formación de poder participar en, en activamente en la economía, en el mercado laboral y también en el desarrollo de soluciones propias para la región y en el avance en ese sentido. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, I move to Gaspar again. Uh, you highlighted the importance of uh, the, the work that will be conducted by this center at the global level. But to be honest, uh, you know, there are many member states or countries that are very strong in artificial intelligence. They already invested a lot. Uh, we mentioned about the United States, China, but also the European Commission are trying to, to lead some work on that. Uh, they are they are member or not member of OECD, but also they are member of other organizations. So you know there is some uh, political landscape that is very important. How you could that Slovenia, as a European country first, can address uh, within this center the global the globalization or the universality question of artificial intelligence, and how we can, uh, of course, we can. We, you mentioned about how to work together, but at the same time addressing in the different regions, so, let's say Africa, for example. How you see the challenges? Uh, also with ICLAC here, I think that there is a, a different culture, the diversity of, uh, of different, of, and, and the, of these regions, and the diversity on, on, on the languages, but also on the culture, on the, and the gaps already existing in the, in the technology. How you can see this center uh, addressing all those, is, all those issues uh, while involving these big member states, let's say? Yes, uh, this is really a good question. Thank you, Moise. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to say that the overall goal or our wish is to have or to establish some sort of a think tank, a global think tank. It's established by a government, of course, but it will be open, inclusive, um, based on a multi-stakeholder approach. So here we would not like to concentrate on governments because it's difficult to be, not to be ignored, for example, by the government of China or the government of France although being an international center. However, however, we have done a big run over the world already before the adoption at the General Conference. We see the interest all, also by the governments is, is uh, big. So there is a big interest. Uh, in regards to your question, I mean, this center will be a multi-stakeholder one, including so from governmental level to international organizations to other centers, research centers, to stakeholders, also to business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we are planning to establish a network of experts, of centers, and as I said, one of the goals of, of our center will be also to help other regions in order to establish similar, not the same center, not with the same, same scope probably, regional centers. So one I mentioned will already be in two years' time, hopefully, uh, in, in the region, in the Arab region. We have CETIC here in, 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 in the Latin American and Caribbean region. We are talking already to, uh, to, to Asia, etc., etc. So um, one goal is also to establish, we know that there are other centers in the field of AI. Yes, China has already a network of AI centers, which is run globally. Uh, we are talking about a world uh, AI organization uh, uh, mentioned by the Canadian ambassador probably somewhere. Um, however, here I see that, um, that this kind of approach that our international research center could be an umbrella center and nevertheless working operationally in, on dimension like, on four dimensions like uh, research, like the development of, of AI talents, so also education, uh, training, networking, etc. Then, of course, also on um, policy innovations, and last but not least, outreach and impact. So here we see if we can manage, and our goal is to, to be fully operational within one year time, probably, uh, hopefully. Uh, and as I said, we, are, we will be inviting the whole world to cooperate with us. And we will come also to other regions, of course. Yes, it will be hosted in Slovenia, a small, tiny country, which m many of you probably do not know where it lies in Europe. But however, uh, uh, we will be visible, yes. and we will work on that, that we will be visible. And yes, 
we will talk to everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gaspar. Very important uh, uh, response. Um, Sophia, you know the situation when it comes to freedom online and, all, and human rights and freedom of expression and uh, the, the report that was uh, uh, achieved by a special rapporteur on the rights of freedom of opinion and expression was presented to the General Assembly recently on AI and the impact of freedom of opinion and uh, expression. I know, we know that the situation is not easy in different countries. How you could, um, uh, let's say, uh, address these issues why we have a lot of challenges, economical challenges, Beside you, Valeria spoke about uh, you know, the, 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 the economic development and how we can link these human rights issues with the develop economic development in countries like Latin America, for example, when it comes to AI development, of course. Sure. Um, well, how can, how can that be complemented? I think human rights, uh, the framework for human rights, it, it's and its obligations and its responsibilities have been accepted and has been, um, they are, are binding for all, all international, for all, for all states that are part of the treaties that they have um, ratified. I think if we are going to um, have any chance of effectually facing the broad range of challenges that AI poses, I think the human rights perspective or the human rights framework that is systematic, that is comprehensive, and that obligates states and that gives a framework for responsibility to companies is, is important, is valuable, and it is, it is the framework for them, for states, companies, and in general, to address, to address these challenges. Yes, there, is, there are economical, economic uh, challenges, but these technologies are affecting, are affecting human rights and need to be addressed and need to, uh, there are economic challenges to addressing the human rights issues, sure. But if the companies, if the states take a, like a step back and since the inception, since the pre-deployment of any of those ideas, they take into account a human rights perspective, these are the economic problems of addressing possible challenges or possible repercussions on human rights. Uh, could be addressed. So I think um, if, if that's the, the angle that you were trying to look with the question, I think, I think that's important. I think the, the states have the obligation to address any, to address their, their, the states have the obligation to address any human rights violations and they have, and they can do it if they, they can tackle that challenge if they implement a human rights perspective since the since the beginning of any deployment of, of Thank AI. You. Thank you. I think that we are um, at least covered all the questions. Do you have any que more questions in the, in the room? I don't know if you have a lot of, more time available to, have, uh, to address some questions. Four minutes, five minutes. Okay. Okay, we have two, three, let's say, let's give them a microphone and then we stop. Yeah, please, in the right level, yeah. Thanks so much. Please. Uh, my name is Felipe Chivas. Eu sou representante para a América Latina e o Caribe eh, do GAP Mill da Unesco e também pesquisador daqui dessa universidade, da USP. E eh, eu queria perguntar para os panelistas eh, se eh, conhecem o conceito, o framework de eh, Cidades Mil ou Mile Cities, Media and Information Literacy Cities. Quer dizer, cidades que têm, incorporam eh, o modelo de alfabetização mediática e da de informação dentro da sua projeção. Esse é um conceito, como sabemos, conceito da Unesco também, e queria saber se existe um diálogo né, entre a inteligência artificial e esse conceito da Unesco, que está sendo, eh, foi lançado a partir do ano 2018, e eu tive a oportunidade de participar no quartel geral da Unesco eh, recentemente em Paris, eh, apresentando eh, métricas para desenvolver esse conceito, a pedido da Unesco. E eh, esse conceito, vamos dizer assim, e essas métricas, né, nós estamos já desenvolvendo em torno de 13 métricas, tem eh, um conceito, eh, quer dizer, uma das métricas, que é a inteligência artificial. Mas a inteligência artificial não apenas como contabilizar 
eh, elementos eh, como cuántas câmeras eh, para segurança você tem na cidade ou quantos elementos e dispositivos eletrônicos você tem ou quantas startups você tem se não as startups que criam com um propósito com um sentido ético com diversidade sustentabilidade por exemplo falando de startups igual a inteligência artificial realmente está eh, sendo utilizada para combater as fake news as deepfakes, ou até para eh, lutar também contra essas bolhas que chamamos de pós-verdades. Né? Então, um pouco essa, essa é a pergunta. Eh, a inteligência artificial yes. está também inserida com esse, e dialogando com esse conceito da Unesco, que é o conceito das cidades meu. Thank you, thank you. Maybe, maybe we can have uh, the microphone to the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman, Bisa, yeah? You're asking for the floor. Yes. And then we, okay, yeah, please, you have the floor there. And then I will address all the questions at the end, so I think it's better to not to respond one by one. We can. Bom dia, meu nome é Paulo, trabalho no Comitê Gestor da Internet. E a minha pergunta vem na linha da cooperação, na verdade. Se não existiria, de alguma forma, uma possibilidade de levantar uma plataforma num fórum multilateral como a Unesco, ou as Nações Unidas, por exemplo, de forma que os pesquisadores assim como os recursos educacionais abertos, conseguissem se inteirar de iniciativas diferentes, como essas que a gente estava falando aqui, que acontecem no mundo todo, de forma a ter uma colaboração mais efetiva. É lógico que não precisa entender o trabalho todo, mas, de alguma forma, possibilitar, na verdade, se inteirar de algo que já está sendo feito em outra parte do mundo, de boas práticas. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman... Okay. English or Portuguese? Yeah, please. I don't know. Portuguese. Okay. Um, my question is maybe addressed to Sarah. And uh, today the AI index report was just published, and there are several issues that uh, they have identified with respect to ethics and uh, ethical implications and social implications. However, China is booming. They are running away in terms of publications in AI, and uh, everyone knows that uh, ethical values in the West and the East are seen under a different perspective. So how can we keep up with the developments in China and to preserve ethical values? And I myself have been working on ethical va values and uh, gender bias in machine translation and several topics. Very good question. Thank you very much. I think we close the list. Is there anybody else who want to have the... F yeah, okay. The gentleman there and the lady. And then we close the list, please. Bom, bom dia. Eu sou Carlos Lima, é, sou professor de rede pública de ensino, coordeno é, o programa Imprensa Jovem, Núcleo de Educomunicação. É, desenvolvemos trabalhos com jovens, estudantes de crianças e adolescentes, para trabalhar a questão da leitura crítica da mídia, produção de mídia. A pergunta vai no sentido de, da preocupação desse jovem, que não está presente aqui, mas ele está em todas as periferias, em todas as cidades, e que, de alguma forma, a, embora a, a inteligência artificial ela atinja toda a sociedade, a gente sabe que, no futuro, não vamos ter muitos empregos, basicamente, são essa juventude que precisa, de alguma forma, ter uma atenção muito especial. A gente sabe que a inteligência artificial ela é um tema do mundo, mas a gente vê pouca participação da juventude em colocar o que eles pensam, de fato, sobre a questão da inteligência artificial. As suas preocupações não aparecem nas políticas públicas, porque as políticas públicas são feitas por adultos, que pouco ouvem a, a, a juventude, as pessoas que, de fato, são e vão ser impactados por isso. É, como vocês são agências mediadoras, eu queria saber de vocês duas coisas. Primeiro, como é que vocês veem a questão da formação dos professores, independente do país, já que os professores eles nasceram num momento analógico e eles têm que ter uma, uma formação para poder impactar nisso? Então, esse é um problema porque eles vão atender os jovens, as crianças de hoje, em relação a essa questão. 
E a outra questão é o seguinte, vocês não acham que a gente deveria fazer um movimento no mundo para ter instâncias de ouvir o estudante para que ele possa, de fato, propor ideias, reflexões, para que a gente não possa fazer algo que exclua, porque, neste momento, a gente está vendo um, um projeto de exclusão mundial, que precisa ser revertido de alguma forma. Então, essa é a minha colocação. Yes, thank you. Yeah. The, the last question, the ladies here, can you bring the microphone and we conclude? And we conclude. Hola, buen día. Eh, mi nombre es Elba Yuger Flores, soy de Bolivia, docente, investigadora universitaria, y veo que la preocupación eh, de los eh, ponentes es eh, bastante amplia en todas las temáticas. Sin embargo, me interesa saber cuál es eh, la propuesta que tienen ustedes sobre el manejo de salud ambiental inteligente, considerando de que Tuve la oportunidad de trabajar con universidades de Bolivia, Estados Unidos, Brasil, Japón y España, donde se plantean diferentes problemáticas relacionadas principalmente con las enfermedades transmisibles. Y a raíz de ello es que elaboré un modelo de intervención que tiene que ver con estas enfermedades, el cual he denominado Salud Ambiental Inteligente con Intervención Preventiva. Gracias. Thank you. A lot of questions, and I think that we need another panel. So I will start with, uh, maybe you can quickly answer these questions, and uh, we start with, um, from my left, uh, Edson, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Are you listening? Okay. Yes. Eu vou falar em português para você em relação ao fórum que você havia comentado. Uh, existe uma das, pro, uma das propostas do painel é, é, é reformular o Fórum de Governança da Internet para que esse Fórum de Governança da Internet ele discuta não somente aspectos da internet, mas também aspectos amplos relacionados à tecnologia. Então, discussões como inteligência artificial, aplicação de direitos humanos no contexto da tecnologia e assim por diante, sejam feitos lá. Tá? E todas as problemáticas que possam surgir em diferentes partes do globo elas sejam levadas, sejam trazidas à tona, à tona e sejam discutidas por, por grupos multissetoriais. E lá mesmo também, legislações ou draft, as cunhas de políticas, elas também sejam elaboradas e apresentadas para governos. E também tá, uh, mecanismos que permitam monitorar se aquela tecnologia está causando algum impacto ou não na comunidade, porque, sinal, isso é um dos principais aspectos. Se nós pensarmos em termos de colaboração, existe uma série de gaps que são extremamente importantes para nós. E um dos gaps está relacionado a métricas. Nós precisamos definir métricas que definam não somente a colaboração, se está sendo, bem, se está sendo efetiva ou não, mas que também que defina, por exemplo, como é que está sendo a aceitação ou a mudança de valores da tecnologia na sociedade. Em relação à questão referente à China, é, isso é um problema muito sério que nós temos que temos que tratar, porque existe uma polarização muito grande hoje, Estados Unidos e China, e nós sabemos que a tecnologia ela não é neutra, ela está longe de ser neutra. E a tecnologia incorpora valores que podem ser valores do seu próprio usuário, mas podem ser valores que estão expressos nos dados. Então, se nós não tivermos representatividade, inclusão, da, ou seja, em termos de dados, em termos da, da, da nossa participação, nós, certamente, teremos nossos valores mudados. Isso é uma coisa extremamente grave, que, na minha visão, é uma espécie de colonização digital. Na verdade, eu vejo, hoje, se nós não acordarmos, nós vamos ser colonos de alguma grande potência. Isso é uma coisa muito séria. Então, um dos gaps para que a colaboração exista é inclusividade. Tá? Inclusão, na verdade. Né? Sim. Tá, mas o meu tempo já tem. <risos> Obrigado. Sim, yeah, por favor. Uh, Pritam. Please. So, uh, in fact, I'll make a side comment based on all that I've heard. You know, uh, before I joined the ITU, uh, I've been here for 12 years. Before that, I was an AI engineer for uh, more than a decade, uh, you know, working at uh, some really cool research labs across the world. And uh, when I joined the ITU, 
AI, you know, it was only engineers tinkering away. It wasn't considered a topic you know, that will earn you money as an engineer. Yeah. Uh, it suddenly becomes super cool. There are so many applications of AI. You know, we are looking at AI in absolutely every area. But I would still urge a little bit of caution because you know, in some areas, such as uh, the professor would uh, probably recognize this as a com fellow computer scientist. You know, in some areas, computer vision, uh, image recognition, it's doing absolutely fantastic. You know, you can get more than a 90% accuracy. But there are many, many applications where the norm is to get a 60% accuracy, 70% accuracy, which is just better than a coin toss model, you know. So the human in the loop is absolutely vital here. And uh, also, you know, in AI, we've had this uh, AI winter. It's a term that you can Google, which, which is long periods where people uh, were disillusioned with the hype and then it completely lost investment. So if we overhype this, then there is a risk that, you know, we'll see another AI winter. So we need to be cautious in, uh, in the promise that AI brings in. Yeah. Valeria, can you answer some questions that was asked for the floor, especially from the region of Latin America, Caribbean? Um, sí, a ver, eh, respondiendo un poco a las preguntas eh, sobre la, el intercambio de experiencias que es, puede ser necesario, me parece que muchos países están en, entrando en estos temas y es importante entonces sí hacer un levantamiento de las diferentes iniciativas que están habiendo, definir indicadores para poder identificar cuáles son los avances, en, en qué áreas son específicos y desde ese punto de vista me parece que es muy importante tener eh, eh, nosotros desde CEPAL hacer un monitoreo y estamos haciendo ese trabajo desde la parte de transformación digital ahora enfocada un poco más en inteligencia artificial de levantamiento de, de políticas, de iniciativas y cuáles son los temas más importantes a fin de definir o eh, evidenciar espacios de posible cooperación eh, entre los países. Al mismo tiempo es importante eh, considerar, como decía el profesor, que estamos en un momento en que los países tienen que eh, abordar este tema y tener participación en los foros internacionales, de tal forma de que también sus preocupaciones queden en relevancia eh, a nivel internacional. Y por otro lado, en cuanto a la participación de los jóvenes, creo que hay diferentes espacios que, donde hay participación de los jóvenes mmm, para traducir sus preocupaciones. Un espacio es el, uh, eh, en marco de las Naciones Unidas, eh, los foros de seguimiento del cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030 organizan espacios eh, donde hay, se llama la participación de la juventud y a, además de abordar distintos elementos que son de, de, de relevancia, también abordan los temas de, de tecnologías. Entonces sí, son espacios abiertos a la participación y, y todos estos eh, espacios son, son de participación multi-stakeholder. Así que invito a, a una mayor participación en esos, en esos foros. Ah. Claro, ahora, bueno, voy a hablar en español, que me siento un poco <risa> más cómoda. Eh, bueno, yo iba a mencionar algo muy similar a lo que, lo que acabas de mencionar. Eh, cuando está, eh, hace poco fue el, el IGF en Berlín y, gran, y varios grupos de, de juventudes expresaron también su preocupación, como usted lo mencionó, eh, de la falta de… Es que sentían que no se sentían, ellos sentían que no eran escuchados necesariamente en, en estos foros grandes de, como de, en que se toman decisiones y en los que se hablan sobre la gobernanza de Internet. Eh, se, les abri, se les mencionó a diferentes espacios en los que pueden participar, pero creo que comparten en muchos foros su, su preocupación. Yo, eh, en, en el trabajo en que nosotros hacemos con el relator de Naciones Unidas, nosotros trabajamos en la Universidad de California. En, en Estados Unidos, en Irvine, y nosotros los reportes que, los, que hacemos, eh, en donde evaluamos la situación de la libertad de expresión, digamos este último que hicimos sobre inteligencia artificial, también lo trabajamos con estudiantes. Yo sé que solamente es un pedazo de, de la pregunta, pero nosotros también tratamos de eh, incluir las voces de los estudiantes, de la, de la comunidad académica. Igual cuando hacemos digamos, estos reportes de análisis, recibimos información de la sociedad civil incluido organizaciones académicas y organizaciones eh, de, la, de niñez. También estamos, y digamos que eso es lo que hemos estado tratando de hacer con, con los informes, pero próximamente también haremos uno, un informe sobre libertad de expresión académica, que puede ser también interesante desde un punto de vista de, 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 los, de, los, digital, de los derechos digitales en general, que digamos que pueden ser, hay otros escenarios en los que se podrían eh, digamos, por ejemplo, con el relator de Naciones Unidas, 
como transmitir estas preocupaciones para nosotros también incluirlas dentro de estos informes. Tal vez. Yes, no. Okay, um, probably to the gentleman in the fifth row here in the center. Um, one of the ideas is, of course, also to make available a platform or so in order to, to make available all discussions and also um, the collection of experiences, knowledge and presentations from different stakeholders in the field of AI. So we, we are thinking not about only organ the organization of, I don't know, workshops or something, something like that, although we have, we have already prepared some this year. There were two of them in, in Kenya and uh, in Africa. One of them was in taking place in, 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 in China already and in Japan last, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, however, we will think about, of, uh, of course, also about a virtual platform and to make it available probably in cooperation with UNESCO because you have a better outreach. Uh, however, I can promise that there will be some chances to, to, to receive uh, 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 this information, what you are looking for. Then probably on behalf of the center and probably also Slovenia, I would like to say once again, as I said from the beginning, we are looking for partner organizations. I had the uh, great feeling and sincere feeling that we can, with our center or the international center, can very good come together with CETIC yeah. in this region. So this feeling I had and, and we would like to, because the center will be probably, as I said, operational, fully operational within one year time. but. Uh, collaborating in, in, in on concrete projects is possible from from today on and we do not need to wait for the signature of the agreement and we would like to propose why not having some sort of a regional I don't know multi-stakeholder workshop in Brazil somewhere uh, together with the EU and the OECD for, for example coming here to this place and bringing people together, also young people, because as also our colleague von Eklax has said, and UNESCO itself is, is looking for the establishment of so-called regional youth spaces. And this, uh, UNESCO is trying to include the voice of youth, young people, also, for example, during the general conference and so on. So there are approaches, and we know about the importance that we have to include young people uh, who are the barrier, uh, uh, the carrier of, 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 of our future. So this is a necessity, and I'd like to offer this uh, uh, opportunity to make something like that. Thanks, so I'll just uh, address the one comment that, that came directly to me, given the time. So yeah, the issue of China. So three comments on that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, off record. Um, no, the first thing is to say that you've identified a, a broader point about the diffusion of AI and the concentration of AI, which we see in patent data and bibliographic, uh, bibliometric data and startups and investments. So it's concentrated in China, it's concentrated in the US. If you go beyond that, it's, it's Great Britain, basically, and, and not really many other places. So I think that's one really interesting point that we need to give further thought to. The second is about the diverging sort of values and systems. So China, of course, is part of the G20. Uh, at the Leaders' Summit this year, they welcomed, together with the other leaders, uh, the G20 AI principles, which are based on the OECD AI principles. I see a strong appetite within the G20 to continue talking about AI, to move on to implementation there as well. And so to that degree, you have China engaged in dialogue and engaged in sort of collaboration with the other countries, and I think that can only be positive. Yeah. Uh, and the third point I'd make is that you do see now uh, a number of initiatives uh, from countries pulling together like-minded partners, and I think you're going to see more of that as we go forward. The Global Partnership on AI is one example of that, and I think through those kind of initiatives you'll see an ongoing push for an AI that is transparent, that respects human rights, uh, and that is robust and accountable, and so again there is sort of the pressures, I guess, on other countries to, to think about those issues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And last but not least, please. Yes. So also to complete on the question on education for AI ethics and more specifically on the initiatives happening already in the AI ethics and governance landscape. So right now you have a lot of online courses already on AI ethics, but it's true 
you don't really have any available resources to really tell about you know, our global initiatives uh, happening right now. And I think part of it is because it's really recent. The other part is because it's on its way. So with the AI Civic Forum, we're actually launching with Mila, which was, I think was mentioned by uh, Madame the Ambassador of Canada in Brazil this morning, one of the best research hub in AI and deep learning in Canada. We're launching the, the AI Civic Forum. And so we're preparing an AI literacy toolkit. Um, of course, you know, the Civic Forum by its name has a big emphasis on civic engagement. Uh, but it means also it's open, you know, to policy makers, to different people around the world who are interested by AI, but not necessarily expert yet in this field. Um, and so if ever you check this resource, which will be uh, available on the online platform, you'll get to know about what AI is, of course, but also about AI ethics and AI governance landscape. So. Please keep an eye on it. And then on the second question uh, regarding youth engagement, yes, yes, and yes, um, I could not be more, you know, agreeing with you. Uh, I was having actually a discussion uh, with, uh, with some friends just during the, the break before the panel about, you know, the use of AI and like connected objects in some toys. So how this touches, you know, very young people, but of course also with like uh, teenagers and uh, how we consume also social media. I know that Brazil is one of the most connected countries in the world uh, to social media. And some people only have even WhatsApp and Facebook available on their phones. So I think this question is really, really essential for this continent, this country uh, specifically. With the AI Civic Forum, we really, really want to be able, you know, to connect with some grassroots associations and be able to not just have forum, with, I think it's complementary to this, this is also an important part of the equation, but also to have some more uh, short, you know, um, uh, small number uh, workshops, so between 30 and 50 people, where, you know, we can gather some insights with some people to who we teach, you know, preliminary about AI ethics, and then we meet them to really discuss some concrete use cases. And then we'll make the bridge, of course, with, you know, standard setting instruments, yeah, yeah. and of course, you know, the global governance landscape. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. Because concluding, I want to address my, 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 my warm thanks to the gentleman who mentioned about UNESCO, because, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just moderating, I'm not representing UNESCO for this panel, but I will highlight that the importance of what you mentioned about disinformation. I already addressed it during my intervention this morning. I think this is one of the issues that, that will be addressed, especially by, our, by, by, by the CI sector, by the communication information sector. And you mentioned about the media and information literacy programs. Of course, it is a, a priority for us. You know that recently the uh, General Conference has proclaimed the week for, for media and information literacy. It's every year, the last week of October, please reach out with this and try to, to celebrate this week because it's very important to engage with all stakeholders to empower the youth and to, and, and to encourage them to, 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 to understand the issues behind that. And AI ethics and AI also is involved in that. We, we can ask the question, how we can involve AI on different program, programs and activities? I can say yes because actually media and information literacy is, a, is an umbrella. We are addressing it to, to, to encourage young people to be able to, 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 to understand, to raise awareness among these uh, uh, specific uh, issues. When you deal about ethics, principles, young people don't consider principles. What are you talking about? I'm using uh, technology. I want, I want to develop. I'm, I'm doing a lot of these uh, uh, tools. I'm, I'm using these tools, and I don't want to care about what you're saying. Human rights. Oh, wow, wow. OK, this is uh, just UN you know, flagship. But what we, so I think the message that we are using with this, uh, this kind of activities is to really use the same language with these young people. And recently in, um, in the General Conference, we organized a panel that was, that was the, 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 the Secretary General of OECD joined us and uh, also commissioner from the African Union and other leading uh, you know, uh, personalities who joined this panel. And this panel was moderated by a young, young student. And it was really, really great opportunity. And, she, and they asked questions, relevant questions. I think this is a, a real, a different mind setting that we need to establish within, while discussing AI issues, because it is our future, and it's not just uh, dealing with uh, uh, what the usual or the traditional way of thinking. Uh, to, to conclude, I think there is a lot, a lot of remarks, very, very brilliant. Really, I, I would be happy to, to, to read the final report tomorrow. And I think that uh, I, I took three, five messages, let's say, or maybe three messages. First of all, we need to cooperate. We cannot work alone. We have, all of us have a lot of good ideas, but we need to work together on, on, this, on these ideas. This is the first message. Second, multi-stakeholder and omni-stakeholder, I say, I need to adapt my terminology, omni-stakeholder approaches are needed 
more and more needed. We need to involve with all stakeholders, not just private sector, governmental, you know, uh, st uh, states and all the governments involved in the AI, as we did in many, many occasions. But I think this is a right approach, is to have a maximum of debate with different stakeholders, to involve them, and to have the same understanding. Because, as I mentioned before, we, we don't understand the same principles in the same manner. We have different understanding. When you're coming from Brazil, or coming from China, or coming from an Arabic state, you know, we don't, we, we don't have the same message, we don't have the same understanding of these challenges. I think this is needed, and that's why we believe in universal AI. We believe that this global and all these tools and organizations, we need to work together to achieve that. We cannot work on, on a regional manner or on the national level uh, while addressing uh, human rights, which is also important and key to preserve because this is really the guide, the guide all our work. And Within that, we need also to adapt the way that we address human rights with countries. You mentioned about China, but I don't want to mention only about China because we are universal. And a lot of countries have a different situation in, while addressing some issues. I can highlight, for example, and I will complement your, 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 your uh, answer. China actually is, uh, is considering implementing the uh, Rome indicators. The, role, the Internet Universality Indicators. I have my director and one of my team are, are in Shanghai right now with the University of Shanghai implementing the Internet Universality Indicators, including human rights-based approach and multi-stakeholder and openness and accessibility. So this is really a good manner of to work together to at least to address those issues. They are tough issues, of course. We are really addressing uh, humanity, the future of humanity. And Working together will be very, very needed, but it's a crucial question. And uh, of course, digital cooperation with an UN system. I think the, 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 to conclude that UNGIS, we need to be fostered, and I will really look forward to work with ITU more on that to help uh, this kind of cooperation within the different agencies. Because we address from different perspectives, but I think our objectives are the same with the SDGs. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to be a little bit late, because you know, you know time is really ticking. And thank you, Gold Applause, for my panelists here, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of the panelists for that excellent discussion. Uh, one of the takeaways that I also bring with me is the need in the framework of international cooperation to ensure that citizens' voices are at its heart, including youth. And this is definitely a message that we will take forward in the framework of our work with the AI Civic Forum the Future Society, and the Quebec Institute for Artificial Intelligence. I would like very quickly to underline that we are more than 450 people in this room and more than 120 people participa participating remotely. So this shows very clearly the interest and the need to encourage these kinds of platforms for multi-stakeholder dialogue on these issues. I would like in this regard, because a lot of the issues that were brought up in the framework of the past panel on international cooperation were directly related to questions of digital transformation and the future of work and the economy. Before passing the floor to our next and first keynote, uh, very quickly would like to hear from Munir Majoubi as it concerns the link between AI, digital transformation, and the future of our economies. What comes to mind when I think of artificial intelligence is a big machine processing all sorts of data. I think it's the next time. video, but so very happy to hear another dynamic woman's voice again. Quand on parle d'intelligence artificielle, ce qui me vient à l'esprit, c'est performance et humanité. À la fois cette envie d'être les meilleurs, mais avec du sens. L'intelligence artificielle, comme toutes les grandes transformations technologiques, elle va radicalement transformer 
l'économie. Elle va transformer les systèmes de valeur, elle va transformer les différentes verticales des industries par la donnée. Avec l'intelligence artificielle, c'est toute la productivité qui va être transformée dans les entreprises. Mais plus que ça, ça va être des nouveaux usages, des nouveaux services et ça va être des nouvelles façons de faire et produire. Ça va avoir des impacts sur l'emploi, ça va avoir des impacts sur les chaînes de valeur. Paradoxalement, l'intelligence artificielle, ça va permettre à certains produits, à certaines entreprises de réintroduire dans leur économie leur processus de fabrication, réintroduire de la valeur. Une stratégie nationale d'intégration de l'intelligence artificielle, elle doit s'appuyer sur deux choses. La première, c'est s'assurer qu'on a les meilleurs, s'assurer qu'on fait bien émerger des experts, qu'on les attire, qu'on les forme, qu'on les construit. Le deuxième, c'est celui de démocratiser. Il faut que cette capacité, cette compréhension et l'utilisation de l'intelligence artificielle, elle se diffuse dans les entreprises et notamment les plus petites d'entre elles. Vous savez, dans une PME, on n'a pas besoin d'avoir les plus grands experts d'intelligence artificielle. Par contre, on a besoin de comprendre ce que l'intelligence artificielle peut transformer dans mes processus actuels, dans nos processus actuels.